marking 60 years of the Queen's reign. We're at Westminster Abbey, the church which has seen more royal occasions than anywhere else. Weddings, funerals, coronations, births and deaths. This place has seen them all of more than a thousand years. Welcome to National Treasures Jubilee Special. Welcome to Westminster Abbey, Royal Church, World Heritage Site and one of the most visited historic buildings in the UK. Over the next hour, we'll be visiting some of the Abbey's secret spaces, talking to the people who keep it looking so beautiful and revisiting some extraordinary moments from its long history. Hello, Michael. Hello. Lovely Good to, to meet you. Coming up, fashion icon Twiggy on the do's and don'ts of dressing the Queen. I was wearing skirts probably up to here. Yes. Then. EastEnder Larry Lamb comes face to face with the current craze for 50s nostalgia. The 50s was a time that people sort of fantasise as being that perfect time. And he also joins us here later. <laughs> Lucy Worsley gets a bit regal as she retraces Queen Victoria's 1897 Diamond Jubilee procession. And Michael Douglas from The One Show joins me on a royal road trip in search of the origins of our monarchy. And you would sit on here and I would go, oh, by the power of almighty God, I will be, put a, pretend to put a crown on me. This I'll hold on to the rings. I give up. Put a crown on me. Come on. I don't know why I bother. It's fair to say, though, that this place lends itself to superlatives, and that goes for the fabric of the building, not just its incredible history. Most of the Abbey dates back to 1245, when Henry III rebuilt it in grand Gothic style. He was mainly showing off to the French, so of course he made sure that this was as high as possible. In fact, it's still the highest church in England. All of which means from up here in the Triforium, one of the few spaces in the Abbey not currently open to the public, I get a glimpse of what was once called the best view in Europe. Well, I tell you, it's not too bad from down here either, Dan. Of course, this year we're celebrating 60 years of the Queen's reign. She became Queen in February 1952 when her father died, but her coronation didn't take place until almost 18 months later on the 2nd of June 1953. The ceremony was held here, like all royal coronations, and the Abbey was closed from the beginning of that year for the elaborate preparations. Normally, the Abbey can seat around 2,000 people, but they wanted enough space for 8,000. Tons of steel and wood were brought in to build seating galleries, and they were stacked up on top of one another, and it transformed the building. By the morning of June the 2nd, everything was ready. Everyone taking part had rehearsed, so the event would go flawlessly. And for the very first time, it was televised live to a fascinated nation, bringing the pomp and ceremony of the occasion to more than half the population. Well, two people who were in the Abbey on that very day are here to share some of their memories today. David Bainbridge and David Overton were part of the 350-strong choir who sang during the ceremony. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming back because, of course, you were young boys when you first sang here, mm. weren't you? How old are you? I was just 12. 12 years old. Yeah. And, and I was only 10. Oh, gosh. Happy memories, though, I it imagine. It is. Amazing. How did you first get involved? Well, after the late king passed away, the Royal School of Church Music ran a series of choir festivals throughout the year, attended by something over 4,000 choristers from around the country. And the next thing I knew at Christmas time that year was that I was going to be singing here in the Abbey. And you had a lot of rehearsals away from home, spent a month away from home. Yes, we did. We were told that we would uh, spend a month at Addington Palace near Croydon. They come from all parts of the United Kingdom. And tomorrow in the Abbey, they will join nearly 400 other choristers. And the BBC filmed it as well. What's yes, they it like did. when you look back at the footage? It was amazing. Involved? I mean, it was, a, it was something very special that happened in my life, yes. 
What about you, David Anderson? This place more familiar to you because you were part of the Abbey Choir. Familiar in the sense that we sang as the Abbey Choir every day in the choir stalls just behind us. But of course, for the coronation, the whole Abbey had been transformed into a different place. Were you aware of the significance of the day? No. Frankly, for a 10-year-old boy, uh, I was just too young, immature, to grasp just what a momentous occasion it was. Were you badly behaved at any stage? There must have been a lot of hanging around, a lot of waiting. You must have got bored, surely. N not badly behaved. Good heavens, Abbey Choristers. <laughs> uh, I do remember that uh, when we got into the Abbey, when we got to our seats, uh, we found in our cassock pockets ham sandwiches, barley sugars and an apple which were intended to sustain us for the hours of the day. But of course they didn't last long. We soon polished those off and I remember dropping the apple cores down the scaffolding poles. Ooh, you wouldn't have done that, would you? No, 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 no. Ours was pillow fights at Addington Palace after dark, what which is was a lot of fun. David Oton, give us a sense of how it feels now to have been part of that special day. Now, the recollections of the event, having listened to the recording, having seen the filming, uh, becomes actually even larger mm. than the recollection at the time. Those are the memories of the pageant, the music, the spectacle of a unique occasion which you obviously experience once in a lifetime. We're very pleased to have had you here. Thank you very much, David Bainbridge and My David My pleasure, Edson. thank you. Thank you. Well, the Queen's coronation was the 38th to have been held here, but have you ever wondered why we have kings and queens in the first place? Michael Douglas from The One Show has, so Dan lured him out on one of their history road trips to fill him in. Cue the camper van. So he's asked me to meet him up here somewhere, but I don't know how I'm supposed to find him with all this fog everywhere. I'm just glad I'm in a van this time, because, as ever, he's got me to meet him at the top of a hill. I mean, what is it with down snow and hills? <laughs> yeah, please, look at him up there! <laughs> look at him up there! Oh, yeah. I've only got three pairs of shoes, <laughs> and these ones are knackered. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? I'm all right, thanks. You all right? Yeah, good. So why am I here? Why have you brought me up here? Because, you know, this story is all about royal history, Mike. Yeah, yeah, well, I've got a question really about royal history. Why have we got a queen? That is a good question, and to answer it, we come to Edinburgh, which is one of the most important centres of royal power in Britain. For hundreds of years, our Queen's ancestors used to rule Scotland from that castle over there. And it's still important, not least, because it's got the Stone of Destiny. The Stone of... <laughs> it's got a sword sticking out of it or something. Different stone. Yeah? Right, let's go and see the Stone of Destiny then. Yeah, there's a little bit of a problem with that actually, Michael. Oh, no, no, it's just over there. You said it's in the castle. You said it. Okay. Just get in the car. <laughs> so why can't we just go and film the Stone of Destiny at the castle? Because the Stone of Destiny is such an important national treasure. It's so precious that uh, people like us just can't come in, just film it at random. <laughs> like even Dan Snow can just go, oh, I've got to film that. Well, understandably, they needed a bit more time yeah. to kind of arrange it. And... Dan No, that's what we'll call you from now on. Well, to be honest, it's OK, because we're going to a place that's just as interesting, just as important, because like the stone, the place we're going to is about the extraordinary tradition that this country has of monarchy. This is pretty impressive, is it not? This is Schoon Palace, then, is it? Exactly, it looks exactly like a palace should, as <laughs> it well. It does, yeah. Even before Edinburgh became this important city, this was a major centre of royal power in Britain. This was a time when Britain was divided up into all these tiny little kingdoms. They're all over the place. Yeah. There okay. are all these little kings everywhere, and, of course, they spend a lot of time fighting each other. Yeah, yeah. And around about the 800s, mm -hmm. you get a king up here uh, in what is today Scotland called Kenneth MacAlpin. King yeah. Kenneth emerges and he starts to and his descendants they start to bring all these little kingdoms together and they mm. create larger kingdoms and that's how we get to the situation where we are today so what's all that got to do with the stone of schoon or the schoon of destiny or whatever i'm glad you asked buddy come and look at this okay okay so it's in here is it no it's there 
That is oh. the stone of Schoon. <laughs> well, they've left it outside. Yeah. Huh? It's not very really good, is it? Well, it, it is also, it's a replica. Oh, so you brought me to a fake stone. Well, yes, but it's what it represents, Michael. This, this hillock here uh -huh. is where the ancient kings of Scotland were crowned. This is where they came to, and they sat on the stone of Schoon and had the crown placed on their heads. Shift up, let's have a sit. But it, it is just a stone. I mean, it's a fake stone. Yeah, yeah, but Michael, a crown is just a hat that lets the weather in, right? <laughs> it's not... It, it's all about this hillock, uh -huh. this stone. This fake stone. This... the replica, yeah. Hmm. The, the crown, together, taken together, they create an impression of dominating royal authority that's very hard to mess with. So, you would have been crowned here, would you? You'd sit on this thing, yeah. shift up, shift up. So, I, you would sit on here and I would go, oh, by the power of almighty God, I will be... Put a, pretend to put a crown on me. I'll hold on to the I, rings. I give up. Put a crown on me. Come on. King Michael of Schoon. Come on. What are these for, anyway? So I, um, I get all that, you know, that there was lots of kings and one, one thing or another, but how do we get to a point where there is just one that governs the whole of... Great Britain or whatever. Mm. Centuries of warfare. You get these kingdoms slowly emerge, like Scotland, England, they slowly swallow up all these other kingdoms, and then they fight each other a lot. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Henry VIII, you know King Henry VIII of England? Yeah, yeah. His sister marries the King of Scotland, and her grandson mm -hmm. becomes the Scottish king. But because he's got English blood in him as well, finally, he becomes King of England as well. He joins the two crowns together. So he's King James VI of Scotland, he becomes King James I of England, and he calls himself the King of Great Britain. So ever since then, that's been it. There's just been one kind of ruler or king or queen or whatever, England and Scotland. Yeah, there's just been one British crown, with one brief exception. And what's that? I'll tell you about it when we get back on the road. Yeah? Yeah. Can I, um, can I watch Braveheart in the, in the truck? Braveheart yeah. is total nonsense. All right, then, what about Rob Roy? He didn't get to watch Braveheart, by the way. I wasn't having it. But despite my best efforts, Michael was a little underwhelmed by the replica Stone of Destiny. Of course, the real stone lived here in this abbey between 1296 and 1996, where it sat in the coronation chair. It's now back in Scotland, although it will return here next time we crown a new king or queen. But the chair, just as significant in terms of royal ritual, is still here. At the moment, it's tucked away behind glass in a conservation booth, but you can still get a good look at it. Staggeringly, it's the oldest piece of furniture in the UK still used for its original purpose. More than 700 years old, it's older than the crown jewels, and it's been used in the coronation of every English and British monarch since 1399. Just think about that. Henry VIII, Queen Victoria, and our own queen, separated by centuries, but they all sat in that chair to receive the crown. But it hasn't had an easy life, and it's covered in scars. Early last century, the suffragettes hung a bomb on it and blew off one of the posts from the top. In the Victorian period, conservators did a slightly ill-advised, changing room-style makeover and covered it in thick brown varnish. And before all that, it was the fashion for boys from Westminster School to carve their names into it. 200-year-old graffiti which proves that small boys have always liked to make their mark on things. Most of the Abbey has thankfully stayed free from graffiti and untouched by the vandals of history. Nothing more so perhaps than the stunning choir stalls here and they give you a pretty good indication of just how important music has been and remains to the services which are held here. Because of the height of the abbey, which Dan mentioned earlier, there are particularly beautiful acoustics. And over the years, composers such as Handel and Elgar have written music just to be performed here. James, thank you very much, and thank you, boys. That was absolutely stunning. Uh, Omar, you perform regularly, don't you, like all the choristers, about eight times a week. Yes. Are there those special occasions you can remember? Um, well, I think the Royal Wedding was um, the best, um, you know, the most memorable occasion we've done. 
Uh, but we've also done lots of other great services, uh, like the papal visits. Um, also, once when Barack Obama came, and we got to shake his hand, and yeah, that's, that was just great, because you know, he's one of the most powerful people in the world. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the Royal Wedding, definitely. Orlando, because you perform so often in the Abbey, do you get more nervous when visiting dignitaries or the Queen or the Royal Family come to listen to you? Um, it's much more nerve-wracking when royalty are here, um, but that adrenaline really keeps everyone concentrating very hard, and so um, generally the services come out just as good, if not better, but we try to be at the top of our game all the time. Well, you sang beautifully. Thanks once again to you and all the Abbey choruses. Thank you. Well, as the choristers said, the Queen does show up here quite a lot, and not just for the, the big occasions. That's partly to do with the Abbey's special status. It's known as a royal peculiar, which is a slightly strange term for a very unusual situation. It basically means that the Abbey is answerable only to the Queen. She appoints the Dean, who's basically in charge of the place. As a result, it's pretty much her church. And over her lifetime, she's come here hundreds of times. To commemorate those visits, the Abbey has put together an exhibition of photos here in the Chapter House. Dating back to the 13th century, this is where the Abbey's monks met each morning to pray and receive their orders for the day. And just for today, it's also home to Victoria Murphy, a royal correspondent. Hi, Victoria. Hi. What does this exhibition tell us about the Queen's relationship with the Abbey? Well, it tells us that she's been here a lot, <laughs> right from when she was a little girl, um, right up until very recently. The Queen has a real relationship with this Abbey that's been built up over many, many years. Is this just work, or do you think she has a real personal connection with this building? Well, yeah, obviously she does come here for big state occasions, but I think it is more than that, because so many personal moments in her life have taken place here. You've had weddings, you've had funerals, you've had moments of great joy and moments of great sadness. And she can't come here for all those personal occasions and not feel a personal closeness to the building itself. There are many amazing pictures to choose from here for spreading over a long life. What are some of your particular favourites that you think shine a light on, on the Queen? Some of my favourites, I really like this one because I like the fact that it's the Queen and Margaret. She was 11 in this picture and it was just before her dad's coronation. The first part of her life, for the first 10 years, she had no idea that she was going to become Queen. And so the sense of just this young girl with, with no idea of what, what lies before her, I think is a really nice, it's a nice moment. The other ones I like, it's got to be this one, her wedding day. And it is, I think it's such an amazing picture because you can really get a sense of like the nervous bride on her wedding day. And I think, you know, she, she was a princess and her father who was walking her down the aisle was the king. But I think they're almost just like any other father and daughter on a wedding day. And I think that's what's so lovely about it is that you can feel the nervousness in this picture and you can almost feel King George VI leaning in protectively towards her because she's this little girl and he's giving her away. On that subject, Victoria, emotion, because I get the impression sometimes the Queen looks like she's going through the motions when she comes to events at places like this. I mean, do you, are there any pictures here where you get a, a real sense of her personality, of her enjoying herself? I think the Queen does often look like she's enjoying herself. People do say sometimes that she looks a bit glum, but if you look at some of the pictures later on in the exhibition, some of the ones that have been taken more recently, you can see that she is, she's smiling, and I think you've got to be fair to her as well, because a lot of the occasions that she goes to are, you know, it's befitting for her not to be grinning away if she's at a memorial service or something. So, looking back at all these photographs and all the outfits and all the, all the, all the events, what's your favourite era, do you think, of the Queen's reign? Well, I like... My favourite pictures to look at are the pictures of the Queen just after she came to the throne and when she was a young Queen in sort of the early, mid-50s. Because I think we forget she was once a young, really attractive, quite glamorous young sovereign and she was captivating people in the way that Kate is captivating people now. Thanks very much, Victoria. Uh, you're not the only one to get nostalgic about the early years of the Queen's reign. 50s nostalgia is big business these days, and we've sent Larry Lamb off to investigate. 1953. The Second World War had been over for eight years. Britain was the third richest country in the world. It had a population of 50 million people, but just three million cars. And the average weekly wage was nine pounds, and a pint of milk would have set you back 9p. And I was six years old and a great fan of Muffin the Mule and the Flower Pot Man. One muffin, Muffin the Mule. 60 years have passed since then, but still some people today are obsessed with the spirit of the good old days. Polka dot milk jugs, 
All sorts of kitsch, or the make do and mend attitude of 50s Britain. People look back on it with nostalgic affection. When I think of 50s Britain, I think of Churchill and the invasion of rock and roll. But there is one particular day that sticks out in my mind. My most vivid memory of Coronation Day was the street party we had with kids from all around the neighbourhood sitting at great long tables, eating cakes and sweets and having the most amazing time. Now that one there, look, if you have a look, this they got the thing to a big old drink, it took all the children. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just me. This was a feeling shared by most of my generation. I've come to Cardiff to meet Rita and Dal Spinola to share their memories. Well, I was about 14, but uh, we had a lovely party. We had jelly and blancmange, we had carnation milk, paste sandwiches, not paste, ham. Paste, paste sandwiches. sandwiches, yes. Lovely Shippham's paste, paste sandwiches. Yes. You see cakes today, but little coloured speckles thrown all over yeah. them. At the coronation, that was the first time I ever seen them over a trifle. Really? Yeah. And, they, what, and they're races, yeah, and along the street. That's the men's races there, yeah, yeah. yes, running down the street. We have musical chairs. Yeah. Where did you get the music? Piano. Well, you put it? piano in the Must, street. Yes, yeah. we always had a piano in the street, yes. Right. My father's favourite was the laughing policeman. Oh, yeah. He always done that, and everybody was a step. Oh, he did it, did he? He did the laughing policeman, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, <and> that's it. <laughs> and it's not just the people who were there. There's a whole new generation who are in love with that era's charm and look back at that time fondly. It's the 1953 coronation. It just sums up what I'm so proud of. Um, it's my family, they're at a street party. People are really proud um, to be patriotic. And it's just a real feeling of, of unity and hope. Angel, Rosie and Lauren are in love with all things 50s and they're not the only ones. There is a massive movement in vintage right now. I walked past one of the biggest department stores and it said, have a vintage summer. <laughs> it's not just about clothing, it's not just about hairstyles, makeup, it's infiltrating the mainstream. This whole word vintage is actually very fashionable and popular right now. Why do you think that's happened? Because there has been, um, over sort of the 80s and the 90s, early 2000s, um, things have been a bit fast for us all. And actually, um, what we're trying to say now um, is that um, let's slow down a little bit. People are going back to old-fashioned values, and the 50s was a time that people sort of fantasise as being that perfect time. So the 50s has earned itself a reputation as a simpler, happier time. Social historian and author Juliet Gardner shines some light on why that is. But it's just generally a feeling that it was a, a gentler kind of society, you know, the crime was lower, that people, there wasn't sort of teenage violence, that people could leave their front doors open, that everybody was very neighbourly, popping in for a cup of sugar on a whim, all this sort of thing. I think we've got that sort of picture of the 50s. And this is the image of the decade that we're in love with. But it is only a snapshot. I grew up in the 50s, and although there are some lovely memories, there are also ones that I'm not so fond of. One of the not-so-glorious things I remember about the 50s was walking to school in the smog. So dense at times, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Special filtering bunny masks are the latest weapons devised to combat smog, which last winter killed 4,000 Londoners in a single week. Anyone getting nostalgic about the 50s should have been with me back in the days when I used to have a 15-minute walk through these back streets to the town hall so we could have a bath, because we didn't have one in the house. The 50s brought some tough times, but don't just take my word for it. I think, actually, there's a sense of disappointment in the early 50s, because, of course, people thought, right, the war's over, you know, peace comes, life will get better. Life took a long time to get better, and the early 50s, you know, were, in many ways, the war without the dangers. Not only was it an era of considerable poverty and great overcrowding, very inadequate housing conditions, crime rose after the um, Second World War, of, not surprisingly, Did perhaps, it? yes. The thing about teenage violence, think about teddy boys. I mean, yep. teddy boys used to go around with razors. But also, I think 
think it was a very tough time for women. I mean, it's all very well, isn't it, to think of mum always being at home, always ready for the t with the tea on the table and all that sort of thing. But I think for women, it could be a very lonely and very frustrating decade. It was also, I think, an intolerant decade. If you think about it, homosexuality was still illegal, divorced mothers, single parents, they were still very much stigmatised. Corporal punishment Corporal was still on the lower books, wasn't it? Corporal punishment and capital punishment. Yep. I certainly have no desire to time travel back to the 50s. And I was there. So how about our 50s obsessed ladies? Do they have any desire to time travel back to the good old days? Angel, would you rather be you now or would you rather have been in the 50s? It's a no-brainer. I want to be me right now. <laughs> And how about you, Rosie? Oh, absolutely now. We've got the choice to dress this way. We have the choice to imitate the, the parts of the 50s that we like without the parts that, you know, weren't so great that people don't remember so much. When it comes to the, uh, the Jubilee, are you, are you getting involved with parties and other celebrations? Yeah, we are. We're also doing a local street party. It's a role that you're recreating, I suppose. You know, it's something your mothers would have been very much involved in because presumably your mums are all about my age. You know, I'm 65, so your mum Mum's about my age. Yeah. yeah, a little bit younger, yeah. Yeah, but she's, yeah. She's... a bit younger. Your mum's a bit younger than me. <laughs> Lovely. That's really. Thank you very much. I'm glad I came today. <laughs> 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 Wow, they're a bit cheeky, but you were won over by those girls in the end, weren't you, Larry? I was. Them and the cakes. Them and the know? cakes, that's what did it. <laughs> they were quite a bunch, those ones. <laughs> <laughs> were you surprised at the 50s revival that you saw? Uh, I was they deeply shocked, I think, really. I mean, uh, having lived through it, I can't quite figure out what they get so excited about. But, yeah. uh, you know, it was all my memories of it were rather sort of dark and dreary, you know, it was, it never, every time he went on holiday it seemed to rain all the time, I don't have any super fond memories of it, except, except the, the coronation party, that was about it really. Yeah, so it's just the parties? Yeah, the part when there weren't a lot of parties around. No. I mean, you know, the, the whole post-war austerity thing. And I can still remember, you know, having to go, go to the sweet shop with the little ration card, you know, to get your, your allocation of sweets, and they were a big deal. And so the party was a great, extraordinary thing with all those cakes and jellies and blamage and everything else like that, treats that were really something special. Yeah. So those of us who weren't there then, do you so, think we're looking back so at rose tinted Those of us specials? that were there then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we are though, aren't we? It yeah, is a bit yeah. rose tinted. I looking think it's back all a bit rose tinted myself. You know, I mean, it's it's easy. It's that kind of. I mean, me, I'm I'm one for you know, kicking out the kitchen. You know, and they're in. In fact, they're in the kitchen getting the kitchen. You know. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different sort of mindset. It's easy to get, you get these people that are sort of really into Victorian era stuff, but I'm, I'm certainly post 50s myself, although, you know, nice to see people enjoying themselves. Yeah, and they were choosing the bits. They said they wouldn't go back. They're choosing that the bits they like. That was the thing, you know, when that po they posed that question to them, you know, giving you a choice, where, where would you be? And they all very definitely went, here yeah. and now, with the choice to do whatever we want, including looking fondly back at the 50s. Yeah. Thanks very much, Larry. Oh, thank lovely. you. Now, all through the programme, we're marking the Queen's reign, and it struck us she has a claim to be the most photographed and recognisable person in the world. So we asked the fashion icon and the first supermodel, Twiggy, to investigate how the Queen gets dressed for her public. I'm amazed by the Queen. For 60 years, she's maintained an image that somehow suited every era and every occasion. But it can't be easy being scrutinised every day. Over the years, I think I've been photographed almost as much, although I was wearing the latest fashions. The rules for the Queen must be very different when you might be visiting a hospital one moment or welcoming a world leader the next. I mean, where do you start when it comes to getting dressed? And can you be fashionable? To find out how the Queen's style was created, I need to go right back to the 1940s. Hello, Michael. Hello. Lovely to meet you. you. I'm so excited. Good. Michael Pick is an expert on two of the earliest designers to the Queen, Norman Hartnell and Hardy Amis. First, he's giving me a privileged look at some beautiful sketches of clothes for the young Princess Elizabeth. Oh, aren't they good? So these are Norman Hartnell? These are all Hartnell. Now, this is the earlier look for the Queen but when she was Princess I mean, Elizabeth. 
they are kind of fashionable, aren't they? I think so, yeah. yes. So what year would this be, do you think? This is around 1947. This is so pretty, look. You know, it's so on trend and fashionable. Especially designed for HRH, the Princess Elizabeth. Yes. And so then, did that mean nobody else got it? Nobody else got it. <laughs> they were all designed for her. And look at that. And this one, after she married, especially designed for HRH. That, I mean, it's gorgeous. That's a real ball gown. Absolutely, Absolutely right. I, I want that jacket. <laughs> oh, my. Looking at these pictures, it's clear to me that Princess Elizabeth, like me at her age, really loved playing around with fashion. But before long, things were going to change. So do you think when... Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth became queen, that had a big influence on how she felt she should dress. I think it probably did. After all, she's queen of the country and head of the Commonwealth. So, so she has to be chic? Yes. She's on record as having said that it's a job that she has to do. And so the clothes have to perform for her. For example, you don't want something as in this picture where the wind suddenly whips oh. your skirt up. And that shouldn't happen to the Queen. No, it shouldn't. The dress is blowing up, you're seeing her knees and seeing her petticoat. Indeed. That shouldn't happen to anybody. No, it shouldn't, but certainly not the Queen. <laughs> no. I think this is rather good, where Hardy Amos <laughs> has put in his comment as short as we dared. That's hysterical. The era what of is the miniskirt. But you can actually see her knees. This is 1970. Yes. Gosh, when I think... I was wearing skirts probably up to here yes. then. That's and then, of amazing. course, the Queen was 44 years old there, so you wouldn't expect to see her in a miniskirt. No, no, anyway, no, of course not, anyway. So I'm wondering, if the Queen's style was already fixed by the 1970s, has it moved on now that she's 86? Stuart Parvin is one of Her Majesty's current designers. We're off to meet the Queen in a special 3D projection studio to take a look at some of the outfits. Ah. Oh. There she is. Doesn't she look sweet? Basically, designing the dress of the Queen means you're creating something for the world's most famous woman who's seen by more people on a daily basis than anyone else. I know, um, that's extraordinary. She also has an image in people's mind that you have to fulfil. Like all of the Queen's designers, Stuart has to work around the rules. The Queen always wears a two-inch heel, hemlines must be well below the knee, and she always carries a handbag. This was for the Queen to go to Melbourne. Ah, oh, hot. She, oh, very hot. Wonderful bright colour. I mean, I called it, called it blancmange pink. She didn't like that. Um, but it was... But it is a bit, isn't it? It is a bit blancmange. It's, it's a fantastic strong colour. I mean, it's, it's really important because the Queen's very tiny and in that, in that sort of block colour with the wonderful hat, she's standing out. She's, very she's, a, she's a real focal point. Yeah. Talking to Michael and Stuart, it's clear the rules are pretty full on. I mean, the Queen can't just step out of the door wearing anything. Her clothes are her uniform. But that doesn't mean she has to be conservative with everything. Freddie! Hello. Hello. Mm, what a great Lovely pleasure. Lovely to see you. Very nice. I'm really excited to meet Freddie Fox. He spent 34 years designing Her Majesty's iconic hats, and I know he'll give me a real insight into working for the Queen. What does the Queen look for in a hat? It must be comfortable. Oh, First of all, of course. comfort is prime importance in all of her clothing. So what was the first hat you made for the Queen? Can you remember? Uh, how could I forget? <laughs> it was the uh, royal tour to Chile and Argentina with six outfits. And so six hats? Six hats. Do you have a favourite hat that you made for the Queen? Probably the most... Um, memorable for everybody is the Silver Jubilee pink one with, the, bells. Pink, with the bells, <laughs> yes. It was perfect colour and it, you know, turned out to be a memorable outfit. Freddie remembers one very specific request he got from the Queen. There was a point when I think maybe I was getting a little bit carried away about the size of hats that I was doing. And the Queen said, you know, I want you to come downstairs with me. I've had the car come around. Yeah. And you said, you see, the brims, if they're long at the back, they hit. Oh, I see. They hit on the back seat. Oh, of course. And so, you know, you can't actually say, we'll just buy a new car with them. <laughs> I did watch the backs of hats after that <laughs> a bit. <laughs> Talking to Michael Stewart and Freddie, I can tell that the Queen is meticulous about every aspect of her clothing. 
I've still one burning question though. Has the Queen ever been, or is she now, fashionable? Well, this is nice Ooh. afternoon tea. I'm hoping Grazia magazine style director, Paula Reed <laughs> will give me her definitive take on the Queen's dress sense. I think she's always been stylish. I really, I do think she is. I mean, she, I think on the Vogue survey, she was listed as one of the 50 most glamorous women in the world. The barber kind of came into fashion well, what, the last barber... year. Do you think people were following her? There was a moment, kind of six or seven years ago, when suddenly the traditional British thing was cool. Mm -hmm. And it was on the runways, I'll never forget, the um, Dolce & Gabbana show. All the models were wearing skirts just like that, at exactly that length, headscarves Head and big boxy bags. And the inspiration was so literally the Queen. But looking through these photos, some might say the Queen could have been more adventurous. Do you think she should have been more fashionable and tried a few more kind of outrageous things? Goodness me, no! It would no, have been <laughs> shocking to see the Queen in a miniskirt, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not that she didn't have the legs to carry it yeah, off. Absolutely. But, you know, clothes are a great communicator. Clothes will actually convey in a very kind of subliminal, kind of subconscious way exactly to people your position, your self-confidence. Mm -hmm. The clothes are about her it's not the style statement or the fashion statement. It's very much about her and the dignity of the role. And exactly. I think even as a very young woman, she had that very much front of mind. Well, it's only tea, but to Her <laughs> Majesty, the Queen. God bless her. So the Queen it definitely gets the nod from fashion royalty there. So, Larry, you, like me, obviously, a complete fashion icon. <laughs> uh, what do you make? Everyone's got an opinion. What do you make of the Queen? Well, I'm a... I'm a bona fide baby boomer, so she's been there ever since I was a little baby. Her reign and my life are sort of run together. And she's sort of, she's been doing things that I've watched on the television all my life. The places she's been, the things she's worn, the horse races, the things she's opened, the, 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 the speeches in the, in, in the House of Lords opening Parliament. You know, all these things go on and on and on right through my life. So she's, and it's what she, she sort of embodies and what she sums up. And, you know, I'm sort of, I'm an amateur history buff, not like you, the full professional deal. But, you know, to be in a place like this in particular, you know, this is, this is what she embodies. It's the history of this country. Well, it's a ringing endorsement here from Larry, and I tell you, he's more excited than I am to be in this incredible chapel here. I've got to hold him into position. <laughs> uh, Sean is back in the nave, and she is there recalling a very recent piece of royal history. The Abbey has such a long connection with the monarchy that it's easy to forget. This is a working church with daily services, a place of worship as well as a tourist attraction. But it's still those big royal moments, like last year's wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, which really bring the Abbey to the heart of our national life. It's thought that around 2 billion people watch the ceremony worldwide, with 25 million watching live in the UK. The building was rigged with cameras everywhere in order to capture every moment of the service. Well, almost every moment, because at the end of the ceremony, the newly married couple, their parents, Prince Harry and Pippa and James Middleton disappeared from view for 10 minutes. They exited through one of the doors at the high altar to one of the few spaces in the Abbey not covered by the cameras. So, what's behind the door? Well, it's this. One of the most private and spiritually significant parts of the building, the shrine. This is the tomb of Edward the Confessor, the founder of the 11th century abbey, and it's ringed by the tombs of the Plantagenet kings. Henry III, Edward I and Edward III, and Richard II. In all, there are five kings and four queens buried here. There was another witness to events on April the 29th last year. The royal party were joined by the Dean of Westminster, the very Reverend Dr John Hall. And hello, Mr Dean. Hello. Before we talk about the day itself, just give us a sense of why this place, the Shrine, is so important. Well, the Shrine of St Edward the Confessor, of course, he's one of the kings who is also a saint. King from 1042 to 1066. He rebuilt the Abbey here. He built his Palace of Westminster here, so the Houses of Parliament meet in what had been his palace, still a royal palace. He was the patron saint of England for many centuries, and other kings and queens wanted to be gathered around him. So it's a very important place. 
a very important place and, of course, the place that the Royal Party came to for the signing of the registers. Just describe what went on that day. So there was, in front of the altar, there was a table with the registers. There are, there are three registers. There's a certificate, obviously, that has to be signed as well. So they signed themselves, and other members of the royal family signed to their witnesses. And then, in fact, the books went to Buckingham Palace afterwards for other members of the royal family to sign too. And once they'd all signed, I got them lined up over here and uh, sent them off. It was such a public ceremony, and as we're saying, watched by two billion people worldwide. And this was really the only private moment. What did it feel like to be part of that for you? Well, I think for me it was an extraordinary privilege and uh, wonderful thing as a whole day had been. I think for them it was just a moment apart, as it were, when they could reflect on what they'd just done and also be congratulated in the way that just as a family would normally mm. at that particular moment, a moment of relaxation. What was the mood like? Oh, very warm and very supportive, very happy. And the whole day was extraordinarily happy. I mean, it's, you could be terrified. <laughs> I felt I yes. could be terrified about the thought of all these people around the world. Well, I wasn't conscious of them at all. And the atmosphere in the church here was, was tremendously warm and supportive and happy. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, William and Catherine are going to be our future king and queen. And last year's wedding was a piece of history we could all share in, although perhaps not as intimately as the Dean of Westminster. Their popularity has boosted support in the monarchy, but royals haven't always been so popular. Dan and Michael now continue their royal road trip in the Midlands, where in the 17th century, people didn't like the monarchy much, and they decided to do something about it. So that thing you said in Scotland, it was James VI of Scotland, he became James I of Great Britain, and we had a king or queen ever since, apart from this one exception. What was that exception? Well, you're right. I mean, there was an exception, which is actually just when they'd managed to unite uh, the monarchy. You've got one king of the whole of Great Britain. Uh -huh. James's son, Charles I, comes along. Uh, he made himself so unpopular that uh, people chopped his head off. <laughs> they chopped his head off? Yeah, what? they chopped his head off. Executed him. It's a bit extreme, isn't it? So he must have been absolutely hated then, Charles. I mean, what did he do that was so bad? Charles had a habit of making enemies out of nearly everybody. He alienated everyone. Uh, and he was absolutely convinced that he'd been put on the earth by God in order to rule. He had a divine right to rule. And that meant that really put him at loggerheads with Parliament, who would say, no, we, you know, we have a right to rule as well, because that was a transitional period. And the politicians and the king were kind of jostling for power as to who really controlled the country. There was a massive civil war broke out, you know, armies marching to and fro. The population was much smaller back then, so historians think it was the bloodiest war relative to population in the history of Britain. Wow. And you've got one side on Parliament and then the other side supporting the king, or is that too simple? Yeah, that's about right, yeah. And there's evidence of this war right across the country. Look at this, so, Michael. Look at this. It's a field. It's exactly what I thought it would be. A big green field. It is a stage on which our history was written. This is one of my favourite battlefields. You get a great sense of it. Basically, one side are up here on the high ground, mm -hmm. the valley in between, the other side on the high ground up there. It Look. looks like a battlefield should do. Who's up here? Over there is King Charles and the Royalists. This is all the King's horses and all the King's men are up there, are they? They are. Yeah? Unfortunately, on this ridge here... Humpty Dumpty's over here, is he? On this ridge here is King Charles's nemesis one of the greatest cavalry commanders this nation has ever produced, a man called Oliver Cromwell. This is the point of no return for Charles. His army is completely annihilated right here on this spot. This is the moment when Parliament, if you like, the, the people stand up to a bad king and say, no longer can you treat us like this. He's captured here then, is he, and then taken back to London? Actually, he's not captured here. He just about manages to escape, but he loses his treasury and all sorts of things, but he just manages to escape. Uh -huh but I'll tell you about what happens next over a pint. Oh, a pint. Why am I doing all the driving anyway? I've driven the whole journey and I like your driver. That's true. As you visit nice historical sites. Talk, I got a knocking in my knees and a wobble in my walk and I'm trembling. That's right, you got me shaking. This is great, a history lesson in a pub. About time and all. 
It's not just any old pub, Michael, because this pub is famous. This is where Charles I, the king, spent his last night of freedom. Really? In here? Yeah. yeah. Local legend has it, this is the room he slept in before handing himself over to his enemies. I bet he got mighty tanked up that night. This is a picture of him back here, is it? Yeah, that's Charles yeah, I. Correct. That's how he wanted to be remembered, in his armour, looking regal, uh -huh. God's representative on Earth, everyone doing what he tells them. But eventually, they put him on trial and they executed him. Did they cut it with an axe or a guillotine? Uh, they would have used an axe. Mm. I always think, a, like, a saw would be better, you know, s like, sawing it off. <laughs> So, Charles is dead, he's gone. So who's leading the country now then? Who's the, you know, the Prime Minister or whatever? The guy that defeated Charles at the Battle of Naseby, Oliver Cromwell. Yes. And he, he basically becomes a dictator of Britain and Ireland, a military dictator. So what happened to Cromwell then? Did, did nobody like him or what? Well, Cromwell was okay while he was alive. People were happy. People were glad there was a bit of stability and the uh -huh. war had stopped. When he died, there was a big vacuum of power, all sort of trouble broke out, everyone's like, oh no, we don't want to return to the chaos. So they invited Charles I's son, Charles II, to come over and be king again. So the monarchy was restored. But you know, I think the best thing, really, that could have happened to the monarchy in some ways is Charles I getting his head chopped off. Because it meant that all the future monarchs, when they did get in a big fight with Parliament about who had more power, they just thought, hang on, I'm going to back off a bit here. Yeah. Because our, my ancestor got his head chopped off. And Cromwell, did he get his head chopped off? Right. Cromwell died in his bed, surrounded by his family. That's quite a nice happy ending for him then, isn't it? Not entirely. Hmm, yes, not exactly. Because to pick up the story, Cromwell was buried here in the Lady Chapel, that's the Tudor addition to the Abbey. Now, it's always seemed a bit strange to me that someone who stood for overturning the status quo and rejecting the trappings of royalty was quite so keen to be buried here, right next to the graves of Henry VII, Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots. Under his rule, as Lord Protector, the stained glass windows were broken and the place was smashed up a bit. Not exactly evidence that Cromwell was the Abbey's biggest fan, yet he was absolutely determined that he should be in the company of all these royals after his death. And that's really the irony with Cromwell. He thought of himself as just as important as any monarch in Britain's history. He really did have the ego of a military dictator. And he definitely had his head turned by the snazzy clothes and the ritual. He insisted on the coronation chair being taken over there to Westminster Hall, where he sat in it in royal robes to be proclaimed Lord Protector. And when he died, he had a massive state funeral modelled on that of James I. So I suppose it was logical, to him at least, that when he died, he should be buried here. As he hinted in the film, Dan, he wasn't here for long. This is the stone that commemorates where Cromwell was buried. You can see the inscription says 1658 to 1661. He was only here for three years, and that's probably not what he had in mind. No, nope, I don't think he imagined he'd be dug up which is exactly what happened. By 1661, Charles II was on the throne and furious with the man who had beheaded his father, he meted out a terrible punishment. In January of that year, they unearthed Cromwell, they took him to Tyburn, which is basically Marble Arch today, and then chopped his head off. Then they stuck the head on a spike as a bit of a reminder about what happened to people who tried to overthrow the monarchy. Well, the same treatment was handed out to fellow parliamentarians who had also signed the warrant for Charles I's execution. And the bodies of Cromwell's wife and other generals were also removed and reburied elsewhere. The only member of Cromwell's family who escaped that treatment was his favourite daughter Elizabeth. They couldn't find where she was buried, so she remains here to this day. Well, if Charles I, Cromwell and Charles II only ruled for a few short, brutal and bloody years, the reign of our own Queen has been long and pretty peaceful. There's only one other sovereign in the whole of our history who's held the crown for 60 years, and that was Victoria. Lucy Worsley finds similarities between her Diamond Jubilee in 1897 and preparations for this year's. It all sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? But those headlines aren't from 2012, they're from 1897. The last time London hosted a diamond jubilee for the 78-year-old Queen Victoria. 115 years have passed since then, but not that much has changed. Just like today, the Victorians were concerned about health and safety. 
overcrowding and who was going to foot the bill. The celebrations were going to last 10 days and the highlight of it all would be the Queen's procession through the city on the 22nd of June. On that day, whoever you were, whatever you did, whether you were a publican or a housewife or a pickpocket, you would have been swept up in jubilee mania. The procession was the showpiece of the festivities. Without TV, seeing was believing for the Victorians, and three million of her loyal subjects travelled from all over the empire to catch a rare glimpse of the Queen. To get the full Victorian Jubilee experience, I'm recreating the 1897 procession route with my slightly more modest horse and carriage. The Queen's was drawn by eight white horses and set off from Buckingham Palace. My get-up is a bit less glamorous, I've just got the two horses, and I'm setting off from the back streets of Vauxhall. The route covered six miles of the city, passing all the famous landmarks. As soon as the route was announced, the owners of every single house and church and pub and balcony and window all along the way went, hooray! Now we've got the chance to cash in because we can sell tickets to spectators. Ticket sales were big business and your average seat would have set you back two guineas. That's around £100 today. An estimated 25,000 seats were up for grabs. Number 63, Piccadilly, just about here, was a jeweler's shop in 1897, and they'd sold seats in their upstairs front window. Seat number 15 had been sold to Mrs. Curtis. There's her name. It's been clearly written in on the ticket there. I bet that cost quite a fair bob or two. The best seats of all were at St. Paul's Cathedral, because here the Queen's carriage stopped for an open-air service. It was said that some of these went for up to £8,000. That's around £450,000 today. Meets you Olympic tickets look like a bit of a bargain. Queen Victoria even ventured south of the river, a first for a royal procession. The Church of St George the Martyr in South London had a prime position on the route and took full advantage. There's a really terrific view up Borough High Street, it's isn't there? a great there? view, That's isn't where it? she would have come down It would have been carriage. perfect. The church made £2,000 from tickets, and the current reverend, Father Ray, shows me how they splashed the cash. Blimey, look at your ceiling. Great, isn't it? So this is what they spent the cash on? This it is what they spent the profits of their stand on? Certainly a lot of the cash they must have spent on this, and it would have been extremely expensive. It's so of its time. It's absolutely 1897. It must yeah. have been strikingly contemporary. Yes. Well, I congratulate the entrepreneurial spirit of your absolutely, predecessor who thought we can make some money here out of this Yeah, yeah, indeed. Look, I wish we could do it this year. Selling tickets wasn't the only way to profiteer from the Jubilee. Any item that could incorporate a picture of Queen Victoria was turned into a souvenir. At Kensington Palace, the curator Alexandra Kim has been busy sourcing Jubilee memorabilia. Today, I guess the classic Jubilee purchase is going to be a tea towel for £2.50. Yep. <laughs> but the Victorians went way beyond that, didn't they? They had way more stuff. I love how inventive the Victorians were. They were just happy to turn anything into this wonderful Jubilee opportunity. So you've got everything here from spoons to playing cards. And there was something, I think, for every pocket, whether you had one shilling or 50 shillings. But it meant that even if you were from the, the very poorest community, you could have a... You could get your own bit of kit. Exactly. What do you think all this tells us about how the Victorians felt about Victoria in 1897? It shows that you know, the Victorians were really, really keen to have something to remember this incredible event, this kind of idea of jubilee mania and the real inventiveness of all of these Victorian entrepreneurs. I take my hat off to them. <laughs> who would ever have thought of a jubilee ginger beer bottle? Well, who knows? We might get one for, for this year. <laughs> <laughs> and the ginger beer would have been flowing. Eating and drinking were a huge part of the day's celebrations. The food historian Annie Gray gives me a taste of who was eating what. So what was the definitive food of Jubilee 1897? It depends who you are, because if you are poor, you've probably come along to watch the procession, you're probably going to buy something from a street vendor. So you might have some jelly deals or some whelks or almost certainly soup, because that's the universal street food at the time. 
if you're slightly wealthier, you're probably going to have had your servants pack a hamper for you. Oh, and what might be in that? Ooh, a game have... pie? Game pie, absolutely. You're going to have lots of cakes, you're going to have obviously butter, cheeses, fruits. I think everyone's Jubilee picnic is going to have cupcakes in it this year. What do you think of the cupcakes? Did Victorians have them? I'm not fond of the modern cupcake. The Victorian cupcake was a little bit more like that. Is that it? Yes. That they is weren't. so disappointing. They weren't. Oh, it's lovely, though, because it's delicate and sweet and ladylike, and it means you've got room for the gingerbread and the pork pie. What did the Victorians think about eating in public? Wasn't it a bit vulgar? It was a bit vulgar. The working classes would eat on the street because that's where they could get the food, but the idea of the rich sitting on the street eating, that, that would certainly not be done. It's one of the reasons that they were hiring balconies and sitting behind glass so that they could have a table and have it all staged up properly. And pretend that they weren't really eating in public. <laughs> yes, very much so, but with a great view of the Queen passing by. It's clear that Londoners were having the time of their lives. But what did the party girl at the centre of it all really think? Well, we think of the elderly Queen as being silent, reclusive, moody. But actually, Victoria's diary shows that she was genuinely touched by the day's celebrations. She wrote that the cheers never ceased and it was a never-to-be-forgotten day. So despite all the moaning and the profiteering and the naysaying, the day was a huge success for Victoria and for her subjects. There was a great surge in affection for Victoria as her Diamond Jubilee, and I think exactly the same thing is happening again today. If you fancy finding out more about Queen Victoria's Jubilee, head over to London's Kensington Palace for their Jubilee A View From The Crowd exhibition. As Lucy observed, 2012 is a pretty big year for London and for the Abbey. It has to look its best for the million visitors expected through the doors. And that is the task of head conservator Vanessa Simeone, who's responsible for looking after this incredible place, including Henry VII's tomb here. Vanessa, how are you doing? All right, hi. Can I, can I help you in any way? Yes, you can help me do some dusting. Excellent, there you go. yes. Right, so what are the biggest challenges when you're, when you're dealing with this absolutely priceless uh, historical artefact? The biggest challenge everywhere in the Abbey is dust and uh, the impact it has on all the different materials. And there's little bits of damage and things, so you have to be really careful, I imagine. You do, yeah. You have to have a really good eye and recognise what you are looking at and recognise where it is old damage or recent damage and also recognise what impact uh, the dust is having on that surface. Well, let's try and go for it. All right. I'll try not to break anything. So we want to remove the dust. We don't okay. want to just displace it. So we just gently brush the dust off the surface and into the vacuum cleaner. It's painstaking, isn't it? It does take a long time. It's very satisfying, isn't it? How recently was this clean? Because there's a bit of dust coming off here. This was clean last week. This is on our, our yeah, weekly housekeeping timetable, this, this particular monument. Where does that dust come from? That dust comes from the tourists that we get in every year. This is human year. dust. As well as being central London, you get all the dust and the pollution, as well as building works, construction work going on or has a, a major impact. Dust staying on the surface of, for example, some metal work can start off um, corrosion and things like that, so you don't want to leave it on the surface for too long. Are we fighting a losing battle? Is this stuff eventually going to collapse, or can you keep it in this condition for eternity? Uh, the job of the conservator is to slow down deterioration. We completely understand that you can't stop things from deteriorating, especially when you're a public building. Uh, we can't stop it, but we can slow it down. and. Uh, we do. And it must be hugely satisfying. It's the most amazing job in the whole world. <laughs> I'm very lucky. Well, good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here in Westminster Abbey to help us celebrate the heritage of this beautiful building. I'll tell you what, Sean, now I realise just how much hard work goes into keeping it in this incredible condition. Mm -hmm. I hope we've whetted your appetites for exploring more of our history during this Jubilee year. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye. From the spectacle of a thousand boats on the River Thames, more on that in just a moment, to an amazing concert at Buckingham Palace. Celebrate the Queen's Diamond Jubilee with BBC One from Friday the 1st of June.